So uh, thank you to Megan uh, for that fantastic talk. So now we are a little bit behind schedule actually, but we're gonna move on to a panel discussion where we're gonna really focus on some of the practicalities of using injectables. And of course, we must bear in mind that I think we've agreed between the four of us, we have two patients on injectable therapy or experience with two patients in real life on injectables. I'll leave you to guess who, it's definitely not me. So uh, welcome everybody. And I'm gonna do a short introduction. So Katerina uh, Estevez Santos, you'll have met at the first session, but in case you've just joined us later on, uh, she's a nurse in Portugal. Uh, we've got Liz Foote, who is a community nurse based in Brighton, which is a city on the south coast of the UK, sometimes called London by sea, though I'm sure people in Brighton don't like that. And then we also have Martina de Haan, who is a nurse from the Netherlands. In the interest of time, I won't do the full bios. So let's kick off. Martina, I'll start with you if that's okay. Yes. What will it take to provide long acting treatment in our clinical practices? So let's just start with that hard hitting. Oh. What are we gonna have to do to get injectables embedded? Well, I think it's best to um, first let the HIV treatment centers themselves get more experienced with uh, the long acting uh, antivirals because we have well trained uh, of experienced nurses with HIV and we can we know the patients uh, ourselves and we are able to instruct our patients ourselves so I think it's important to start in the HIV center uh, and then when there are uh, more people uh, who are going on the long uh, acting injectables then I think it's good to um, to um, get in contact with the home care organization and instruct them to administer these long-acting uh, antivirals. So, so, do, so do you mean that you, you see a way of having medication delivered to people's homes and administered at the same time in people's homes? So delivering in the community rather than in clinics? Well, I think at first it's, it's important that we in the clinic uh, get more experienced and then from out there we can go and get in contact uh, and instruct the uh, home care organizations uh, yeah. how to yeah. provide. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. So with that in mind, so Liz, you, you are a community specialist nurse. So what's your view on providing long acting injectables in a community setting, taking the drug to the patient rather than bringing the yeah, patient to the um, clinic? So, so, so I've got experience of one very, very um, complex patient going on to long acting injectables we started her on the long acting injectables last february so sorry not this february the february before so it's february 2019 she's still on the long acting injectables doing incredibly well so the community nurses um what it entailed was very very good relationship close relationship with the pharmacists in the acute setting letting them know exactly what day we were going to go and um, administer the injection, making sure they knew exactly the time that we were going to go and pick up the injection from the pharmacy in the fridge. Um, so I think really, really good communication is key between the community nurses and the acute team. But our experience um, since February 2019 is that not one month did this patient not engage with us. She's not missed one dose. It has been a um, really, really positive um, experience. And so, Liz, if I could just just follow up on that a little, do you think, I mean, in, in Brighton, for example, yeah. would you have the capacity to make that the standard mode of delivery for injectables, or is that always going to remain for specific patients who kind of need your input for other elements of their care? Absolutely. I mean, I, th I think what... Um, when it comes to the community nurses um, administering the injection, we're talking about small numbers of people. We're talking about a very small cohort of our caseload that are struggling so much with adherence that in a sense, this is their only option now. Um, so in that sense, we have capacity. Um, we don't have capacity to start administering injectables to lots of stable patients that might suddenly want injection. So again, when it comes to community nurses, very much their focus would be on the very complex patients, which would be a small number. Yeah, yeah. 
So, so that's focusing on people who are already accessing community services. Katerina, I know you're um, mainly outpatient based, but your service also does community work for some of the opioid replacement programs. So what scope is there, do you think, for using existing community programs for other things, using those to help deliver injectable HIV treatment? Do you think we could combine the two? Yes, I believe that because I really believe and we promote here in, in Portugal and at Cascais Hospital this integrated and shared care for patients. Because it, right now, if we have patients with one or more comorbidity and refer to one or more health service that are apart uh, from distance, I really believe this, this integrated and shared care with tailored plan for nursing and interventions are, are really a success for this. And this injectable drug is one of the things that should really step in in this kind of community-based interventions with uh, the health hospital team going there. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, changing a little, Martina, coming back to you, what do you think are the major risks of implementing long-acting injectables? We've talked a bit about you know, the practicalities. What, what are the risks, in your view, of introducing this as a routine way of delivering HIV treatment? Oh, maybe um, it's, um, it's the, the incompliance of the half or annual follow-up uh, for people when you are getting every two months an injection. Um, then maybe you don't have the need anymore to go to the hospital. And But it's more than only giving a medication. It's also uh, the um, lifestyle management, the comorbidities uh, treatments, the um, quality of life of people. So I think it's more than only medication. So I hope that it's not going to be a problem with the compliance for the annual meetings with the nurses and the doctors. Yeah. And, and on the subject of sort of compliance and adherence, Liz, you know, many people have, have discussed the fact that injectables may be ideal for people who struggle with the adherence to a daily tablet regimen. I mean, do you think poorly adherent patients are the right group to be targeting or should we initially at least be focusing on stable patients when we introduce injectables into our practice? So I'm always a little controversial and I know that. No, I think we should be completely concentrating on the really um, on the really complex patients that struggle with adherence. So certainly for the patient that we started on injectables last year, this has completely transformed her life. Um, and and this was a lady that for years after you know since being diagnosed had never managed to become undetectable, and it wasn't because she didn't want to be undetectable. She just, her life is so chaotic. She just couldn't manage to do it. It has completely changed her life. And to see that is, is amazing. So no, I think we should be completely concentrating on people like her. Yeah, well, that's right. I think, I think, I think that's, the thing is you need, you need the people who are poorly adherent enough to be chaotic, but um, haven't taken enough medication to get resistance, of course. Because I think that's one of the, when we think, because already in our discussions locally, uh, we discuss patients who are already thinking, oh, they might be good for injectables, but the difficulty comes. And, and thinking particularly of some of our um, patients who've got vertically acquired HIV, who may have had multiple treatments during their childhood and adolescence. Um, yeah, that can be challenging. But sticking on the adherence topic, um, Katerina, in your experience in Portugal, what, what are the main things driving poor adherence? Because obviously there's different patterns of poor adherence. There's different factors that um, promote poor adherence. What, what's your experience? Regarding the poor adherence here in Portugal, we have we have a different population, I think, from all of you, because we have a lot of people that come from Africa. We have a lot of HIV type 2 as well. And this is uh, the key populations that we have is, are really difficult. Most of them don't talk Portuguese, so they don't have family here. They are not legal here, so the poor adherence remains really difficult with this kind of population. Um, as well as we also have a lot of drug users and right now in this pandemic, we have a lot of people that are using uh, again. So this is a problem um, because people right now, as you know, uh, we have a lack of uh, jobs and people don't have income. 
So the poor dealers absolutely remain with this because right now people are focusing on having money to eat and not, not to come to the hospital. Uh, but we have a really good nurse uh, intervention here <laughs> by myself. So I do a lot of follow-up with these patients by phone. And we work uh, really, um, we have a really direct line with all the community-based service that we can with NGOs and um, churches and community pharmacies and every, every community-based program that I can stretch and communicate just to, to get this patient linked and retaining care will do. So we have this tailored plan interventions because the poor endurance is really a problem more in these communities that I told you because they are really cl closed and it's really difficult to get it. So this is the, the religion and spirit, spirituality yeah. uh, part. Thank you. It's a big word <laughs> and, different and difficult. It's really the key issue for us to, to get it into the community. Yeah. Thank you very much. So now I'm uh, thinking about some of the populations that Say touched on in his talk um, and he talked about the issue of pregnancy because of course if a woman becomes pregnant on an injectable um, she is on that drug and uh, we can't just stop it or switch it very quickly. So Martina do you think long-acting therapies should be made available for women who are of childbearing age or planning to conceive? Uh, do you think we need to be concerned about ensuring they have adequate contraception? What, what's your views on that particular issue please? Well, in our hospital, our, uh, the only uh, person uh, we have on uh, long-term injectables is a woman from 26 years old. She is a fugitive from Nigeria and she is a lesbian woman. So she came about a half a year, she started with the, the injections um, because of bad, uh, poor adherence. And uh, well, then we discussed, of course, the subject of getting pregnant. And at that time, she didn't want to she didn't have a child wish at that moment but um she um now one year later uh, she's well we have been very much difficulties to well it's going okay but she, there are some difficulties to get her in the hospital sometimes and sometimes she's too late and, but it's okay she's doing fine but now at, at this moment she's uh, telling us that she wants to have a baby because uh, she's feeling very much alone she has a lot of psychological and social problems she cannot manage her own life very well so we are very well we are in a dilemma now because the injections are of course the best option for now but yeah well getting pregnant during cabotegevir is not really um well it's not advised there's no much evidence of um cabotegevir with pregnancy so well it's a dilemma and we we are struggling with it so yeah. i think it's it's important to think about this before starting uh, the uh, injectables. Yeah, and I guess you know I, I'd be interested to hear um, Liz and, and Katarina's thoughts on this as well because I think let's imagine that we rolled out injectables a few years ago and and yeah. injectable cabotegravir was already being used and then we saw the data around the neural tube defect signal for dolutegravir. Now, of course, since that initial signal in 2018, with bigger follow-up and um, there, there's that signal has been attenuated so it's no longer statistically significant there's still a small numeric excess but you know I sometimes imagine what what it would have been like had we seen that signal when there were already women on, on the injectable and I guess because cab and dolutegravir are so similar we can probably extrapolate the sort of now more reassuring safety signal of dolutegravir to cab but I think one thing we learned, of course, is, is that we need to engage women in that conversation and the rather knee-jerk reaction that many countries had to that initial data and followed by very strong community pushback. So, Liz, perhaps first of all, you know, what, what's your view? Is this a sort of something where we should say you must be on contraception or is it something that we discuss and let women make their own choices? Um, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a big advocate for patient choice, um, but I do... You know, I, I really believe that we need to be informing our patients very, very honestly and very, very clearly about the risks. Um, certainly with our patient last year, um, she had an appointment prior to starting on the cabotegravir and the real pivoting. She had an implant, so she's covered for 
three three years with, at least so that's mm -hmm. good but yeah no I, I you know I think women have the right to make um, a, an informative choice we can't stipulate can we but yeah. we just need to make sure that they've got all the information that they need yeah yeah and I think the other thing um that was quite striking for me after that initial signal was it was all like focusing on the potential negatives of a woman being on dolutegravir and it took some months before people started doing modeling that allowed for the benefits as well and of course if we're thinking about injectables there are going to be potential benefits that for that individual may well outweigh any uncertainties or unknowns. Katrine, have you got anything to add in terms of sort of the female patients that you see and, and whether you'd be comfortable starting injectable HIV treatment in those women who are of childbearing age? Well, we try to, to promote health literacy regarding the pregnancy as well as the drug-drug interaction because it's, it's a, a big issue that patient have to know. But honestly, if, the, if, the, if they are a woman with uh, fertile age, we, we try to put it, and we have also a, a very linked uh, relationship with um, the colleagues from John Ecology as well, because we really try to, to have the same language as well as the same education role regarding the patients and honestly we also most of the times we, we laugh the patient and, and I said if you want to have baby please I have to know first I will have the, to be the first person to know <laughs> if you are planning on not the father me and they normally they 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 respect that because we we really engage in this with uh, communication and empathy and health literacy is really important because information is a key for being safe and keep on being safe yeah yeah so i want to change now a little bit onto the kind of, sort of training and teaching that's going to be necessary in order to, to introduce injectables and what do you think so i'm going to start with you liz of course because you are soon going to be chair of nivna so is this something i mean do we wait for Vive to tell us how to do this or do you think we need to be embracing it now and, and kind of organising education ourselves on a national or even as we discussed earlier, perhaps a, a pan-European level where we create a, a nurses network? Because I think clearly nurses are going to be absolutely key to us embedding injectables into care. So what, what's your view of the role of, of, of networks and national organisations in all of this, please? Yeah, I think we definitely need to be preparing sort of the nurses who are pivotal in this. The nurses, using Eileen's word of pivotal, um, <laughs> we should definitely be preparing nurses now and really educating them now around sort of um, administering long inject long active injectables and the the risks associated with that. And um, when we started um, over a year and a half ago. You know, we didn't have much information, um, and and it was it was quite um, it was a little scary, if I'm really really honest. Um, and I think it's really important that we we prepare our workforce on not just a national level, but we really share experiences with our colleagues in Portugal and 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 elsewhere. Um, yeah, on on sort of best practice, Martine, you you'll have tips probably for, for us here in England, and we might have tips for you. So sharing that information yep. is so important. Yeah, yeah and, and so Martine, on that topic, yeah, what, what existing networks do, do you have in the Netherlands? Uh, do you think that injectables is an opportunity to strengthen those networks? What, what's your view on how we can all best work together to use injectables safely? Uh, well, I think it's important to have a good uh, uh, connection with the home care organizations and it could be a challenge because of the, the spreading of the HIV patients in our country, for example, it's not, they're very much spread so it's very, sometimes it could be difficult to uh, get in contact with the, the, the organizations who just have a small amount of uh, people in their uh, care. So that's going to be a challenge. But I think that we as a nurse also in the, the HIV treatment center should be uh, very important in that role to uh, organize trainings and uh, for individual uh, organizations or, or for the smaller organizations also. Yeah. 
Yeah. And and Katrina, what about you? What what networks do you have already in Portugal? What more do you need to roll injectables out? Um, we have a really tiny tiny nurse network in Portugal, but we also have, um, I work with the European HIV nursing network, so we really are straight with the Netherlands and also Niva as well in, in the UK. And I really believe that right now, all of my colleagues, that is, this is absolutely a nurse-led intervention. So I really think it's maybe we should do a networking for this injectable drug use and do small videos as to share because I think real information and valid information with practical interventions and Q and A's that the patients do. So we really need to share this knowledge that all the other colleagues have. So mm -hmm. I think is missing right now is a European networking on injectable drug <laughs> and yeah. therapy. Well, it's, it started here. So we've already got a Netherlands, Portugal, and UK network, and it can only grow. So we've only got a couple of minutes left. There's one question, which is about, are there any drug-drug interactions between antacids and injectables? And the answer to that is no, because that's a chelation effect in the gut. Um, so no interaction there. But although injectables, of course, are not without drug-drug interactions, as, as Say covered in his talk. So just a, a, a brief answer from each of you now, just to finish off. There's a lot of uncertainties, of course, and, and some of those we're not going to learn until roll out the use of injectables but what what's the one thing that that you would really like to know about injectables so for me for example i'd really like to understand better wh when do we need to start worrying about giving bridging so say covered the concept of bridging if someone can't come to clinic that you give them a, an oral um, supply of the treatment to, to bridge that gap if people are traveling for example so for me that's one of the things I'm, I'd like to know more about is there anything in particular that you would like to know more about for injectables to be more confident about rolling it out in your services so I'll start with Martina if that's okay um, well learn more about yeah well uh, well I would um, well because the the, the 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 side effects of the the injections um, well, I hear a lot that it's not that big of a problem about the pain, but I experienced with my patient that she's very, well, uh, anxious of getting pain. And in the beginning, there was a lot of pain. So it's getting better, but I, well, I would like to know more about it. Well, I know that that yeah. should be that painful, but I think that's an yeah. important thing to take with us. No, absolutely. Uh, Liz, what's the sort of one major thing that you'd like to know a bit more about? I suppose um, there's not a specific thing I'd like to know more about, but I would really love to start seeing more people in England for a start um, being put on the injectables and sharing those experiences of what those patients have yeah. found. Um, that's what I just want to see that because it's it's really difficult. You know, both me and Martina have one example, and it would be really lovely, you know, in a year's time to have ten examples. Yeah. Um, yeah. To talk about. Brilliant. And Katerina, finally for you, what's what's the main piece of information that's missing at the moment? I think right now, as Martina said, the, the side effects. Yeah. I, I think for for me as a nurse, it's it's the key issue that really is missing to give me a bit more of security. Sure. <laughs> I think. Sure. Well, hopefully we'll be gathering that data as these drugs are rolled out. Certainly, Liz, I think your optimism in England, it may be a little more delayed here because we tend to get these drugs slightly later than the rest of Europe, of course. But I'm going to close there. We are bang on time. Thank you all so much for your contributions. What I think was a really interesting discussion. We now have another coffee break. I shall say goodbye because the next part of this meeting will be ably and more competently chaired by my friend and colleague, Professor Anton Posniak. So thank you all very much for attending and I look forward to seeing at least some of you in real life in the not too distant future. Thank you very much. <laughs>